Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Andy Stein. I will be your uh, panel moderator today for the um, open document format. But first, before we start, I'd like to uh, thank our conference uh, sponsors. At the diamond level, we have IBM and Microsoft. At silver level, Novell, Unisys, and Open Solutions Alliance. At the bronze, Collaborative Software Initiative, Red Hat, and DLT Solutions. And we have one communication sponsor, sponsor Box Popoli. I would like to remind everyone to please fill out evaluation forms. We would like to know your opinions about this session and all sessions. Okay, uh, as uh, far as introduction, I will um, state this one uh, few bullets on this one slide. This is uh, my view of what the users want out of open document formats. We want a grand unification, a single universal format, one standard. We want a grand convergence of desktop, server, and web. We want choice. We want future office products decisions not limited by previous decisions. And we want investment protection. We want compatibility with existing file formats and documents and interoperability with existing office applications. Uh, here is the agenda for this panel discussion. We're going to spend approximately 30 minutes in presentations. I have five distinguished panelists. Uh, they will each have the floor for one slide and five minutes. And then we'll do questions and answers, approximately 30 minutes. Please submit questions on cards. Um, we would address that, and, and please address them to a single panelist. So be specific who you are addressing your questions to. Uh, in, uh, as a reward for asking questions, we are offering a free CD and uh, for the first 24, 25 uh, questions. So uh, be amongst the first 24, 25, and we will give you something of value for free. And this is what is going to be on that CD. It is uh, the latest version of the OpenCD, if you know about this project. It's an open source project that packages together the most um, uh, high quality open source uh, software that uh, is available on a Windows platform. Um, and you, you, you will see the uh, list of software that's included. Um, you have OpenOffice, PDF Creator, and many others as, as this slide shows. Uh, also included on this CD is a web content management system, government portal that my organization created and offers it uh, free of charge. And it's on the CD. It's called OpenEGov. Uh, this is uh, the latest and the last open CD that's available. Uh, if you check Wikipedia, you will see that this project has folded as of uh, uh, the 27th of September. So uh, this is uh, a collector's item in a sense. Uh, <laughs> but what you have is the latest versions of all this open source software. So there's going to be no upgrades to this CD, but there will be upgrades to the individual open source projects that are on the CD. OK, so here are the panelists. Um, I've asked the panelists to all address one specific and practical question, which is, what should we do? What actions should we take in light of competing open document formats? And the panelists are, uh, from my right to my left, Bob Martin, Director of Legal Affairs at Open Document Foundation, Jason Matuso, Senior Director of Interoperability with Microsoft, Doug Johnson, Corporate Standards, Global Government Strategy with Sun, Arnaud Leor, Open Source and Standards Program with IBM, and Jim King, a Senior Principal Scientist with Adobe. So, uh, we are starting from, uh, from my right to my left, and here is uh, uh, Buck Martin. Buck, you can stay, stay in your seat if you'd like. It's up to you. Uh, this microphone right there. Thank you, Andy. Um, Hold on. Nope. We're short some juice here. Okay. 
Hello. Back out. There we go. Sorry. Open up here. Yes. The question I get most often is why a third set of formats? And the simple answer is that we can't get to that grand convergence using using either Open Document or Office Open XML. Uh, both of those standards have interoperability barriers built in that uh, get in the way between uh, exchanging file for files between different systems. So we uh, banged our heads on the Open Document Technical Committee for five years trying to uh, turn open document into a set of formats that could express the full range of features in Microsoft Office uh, and finally gave up when it became clear that uh, the technical committee just wasn't going to give ground on that issue. And so at that point we started looking around for a different set of formats that would allow us to achieve our goal of delivering what we believe the, the market requires, which is uh, nearly flawless interoperability with open formats, uh, a way of escaping the vendor lock-in problem uh, with formats that are truly universal. Now, weaknesses in both Open Document and in uh, Office Open XML include uh, a raft of proprietary extensions in each one. Um, we have an ISO standard for Open Document right now, but no one with a feature full uh, editor is using that. Uh, they've all moved on to Open Document 1.2. And uh, so at this point, we can say that we have an international standard, but no one is using it, except for lightweight applications. The compound document formats uh, hit all of our points in, uh, that we were after with our plug-in for Microsoft Office that uh, does accomplish uh, nearly flawless round-trip interoperability between the um, Microsoft binary formats and um, compound document formats. The uh, originally we were shooting for doing it with the open document, but we required five generic extensions to the open document standard in able, to be able to express some of the things that are in Microsoft Office that are done differently from how they are done in oh, the open document standard. So. Um, as I said, I, I think we, we found our answer in the compound document formats. Uh, we're online, on schedule to uh, have prototypes done by late, later this month, early, early November, and are aiming for a January product shipping date, which will be a free download. And, um, I think at that point uh, it's going to be up to the folks out here whether they want to give that a whirl or not. But uh, I think the bottom line is that there is not going to be a big vendor solution to the interoper interoperability problem 
uh, that deals with the quality of data that is needed in business processes. Uh, if, if we were writing on a clean slate, we wouldn't have to worry about a lot of things, but the truth is that uh, most of the world's legacy, legacy documents are stored in Microsoft binary formats. And uh, if you can't do the kind of interoperability that lets you work in a, you know, a service-oriented architecture, um, the web services uh, from office suites, whatever, uh, if you can't get a quality file conversion, then you're asking for data error, error, errors in an automated process. So Mr. Martin, we have to wrap up. Is okay. Okay. Yeah. Next is uh, Jason Matuso, Microsoft. Well, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to Portland. I'm a Portland resident, so it's always enjoyable for me to have uh, uh, events here, so I don't have to get on an airplane, so that's always a, a big plus. Uh, so to the question of document formats and, and what should you focus on as individuals who are looking at um, government environments, uh, I guess the, the very first thing is this idea of first principles. And that taking a step back and considering what are the implications for, um, uh, for my environment is really going to take a moment to consider what, does the, what was the movement for open documents, uh, how did that begin and, and why is that there? And it really comes down to the idea that people were looking for an effective means of uh, data exchange, for thinking about uh, interoperability has been mentioned here. Um, uh, how do we focus on the ability for us to take not only information that was created in the past, present, and future, and make sure that we get, uh, get access to those, but how is it that we are going to work across organizations, deal with the fact that we have highly distributed environments um, now obviously an incredible change in the number of devices that are creating uh, information and so how is it that I'm going to be able to get that data in a way that is um, meaningful over time and as you then look at that problem set and you think okay am I going to do e-government services how is it that I'm going to even be able to have uh, just uh, my own internal organization functioning uh, efficiently it's really a question of the tools that you're using and this question hasn't changed the idea of the format is, uh, the discussion of the format is around the, per, what the tool produces. And so, you know, in some ways document formats, to, to bring it to an incredibly simplistic level, the document format is the weight of the paper, the color of the paper, the size of the paper, maybe the lines that are on the paper. But the ink that is there, um, or that was placed there, I should say, is going to come from the tool, the pen, the protractor, the ruler. And so is it Microsoft Office? Is it OpenOffice? Is it Google Docs? Is it a thousand different ways, uh, Adobe products? How is it that I'm producing this information, of course, remains the first question, because that is going to dictate what happens with that information once it's produced. And in that process, you then start to say, OK, how do I then achieve interoperability? Uh, being, of course, the primary question where um, uh, open documents, uh, where the focus on op open documents came from. And at that point, I would challenge you to think that it's not necessarily about uniformity and this idea that you should have a single, all-encompassing convergence because you're going to end up having a richness of application developers that continue to progress. And there's a reason that Adobe's format is different than Microsoft's, and Microsoft's is different than what was produced in the past by Lotus, which was different than what is produced uh, moving forward with, with, um, with new products like OpenOffice. And at that point, it's not about uniformity. It's going to be about translation. And can I effectively translate between these environments? Can I make use of XML technologies to get that done? Are there translators that are available to get that done? Are going to be incredibly important in this discussion of do I meet my needs at the first principles level? And then my final point, and I'll, I'll be brief on this, is just that interoperability in this discussion of interop is not just about a standard. The standard and standardization process is, of course, critical in that discussion. But it's going to be about what products are built, what are the implementations of those products, how are those standards implemented becomes, of course, the way in which you, as consumers of these technologies, interact with those standards. Secondly, the communities that support them, the relationships that exist not only from business to business, but developer communities or um, 
um, or, or uh, uh, consumer groups and how they make use of these things. And then finally, access to the intellectual property that underlies these standards and underlies these technologies is also going to play a critical role in that interop. So as you look at these, these elements, I put it up there in a stack because I believe that as you consider about what are my steps, it's going to be based upon a progression of thought rather than looking at it and saying, let's just jump to the fact that we have all of the world in one big format. It's just not a reality. There are hundreds of formats out there today. There will be hundreds of formats out there in the future. And the question is, how do you work with those formats in a way that's meaningful and effective for your business? Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, hold on, Doug, just one second. I only have one question up here so far, so we could spend 30 minutes discussing it. Or if you have other questions, please uh, send them up. I have volunteers picking up your questions, OK? So keep on sending them up, please. Uh, next is Doug. And, and if you don't ask questions, we'll uh, talk again. So <laughs> it's in your own best interest to ask questions. Uh, I'm Doug Johnson with, uh, with Sun Microsystems. I'm actually in the uh, Massachusetts office of, uh, of Sun. So, uh, so I've actually, um, I'm intimately involved with the, we used to call it the Massachusetts miracle, but, but their approach at, at, at um, a reference model, a technical reference model that, that used open documents has been, uh, as many of you know, kind of a core of all of this stuff and, and kind of an, uh, an interesting and, and, and very nice example of, uh, of how, how some of this progress goes or how some of this process of, of looking, at, uh, looking at standards, looking at office, office formats in particular, how, how it's gone. Um, actually, I, I wanted to start in a different place, though. Um, this year at, at Harvard, um, Bill Gates gave uh, the commencement address for, uh, for the Harvard graduates. Um, it was interesting because it, it, it was not a technology-driven or, or, or even Microsoft-focused kind, of kind of an address. Um, he, he was looking at, at the issues that he's devoting the, the, the balance of his career to and, and of course, what, uh, uh, what the foundation that, that he intends to head up shortly um, is addressing. And this, these are big problems in the world, things like AIDS and, I'm sure, um, uh, you know, education in, in third world countries. Um, his message was extremely simple and very ac accessible to, to anyone. And it was simply that don't uh, don't lose sight of the forest for the trees. The, these are these are AIDS, for example, in in Africa, is a is an exceedingly complex problem. There's lots of aspects to it, but but don't get uh, 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 dissuaded, sidelined, or or otherwise confused by the complexities. Look at it. Look at it. Look at look at it from a large perspective issue. Uh, develop and and he he had a four point plan on on what to do about it. Identify where you need to be at at some point in the future, and and identify ways of moving you towards there, and and then get on with it. In other words, don't, don't be paralyzed by analysis of the issue. Um, I found it extremely instructive because I think, I think exactly that, that kind of an assessment and that kind of analysis will help you in, in, in what you're trying to do about document formats. Um, it, it is, um, I wasn't part of the IT industry a decade ago, so, so I, can, I can say with complete um, uh, abandon that, that I actually blame and I apologize for the IT industry for not having created a standard in the office document space sooner than we did. This, you know, it's an oversight, what can I say? Uh, as, as users, you've been handed from one dominant market player to another who either uh, uh, inadvertently or vertently, <laughs> intentionally, ha have used document formats as a way to to keep you you know keep you locked on their platform. Um, the the it, it's kind of novel in the IT industry that that occurred. For example, it didn't occur in networking. If you look at 10 years ago more like 15 years ago now, uh, networking, there were four or five kind of roughly equivalent networking stacks that people could use. Uh, Microsoft LAN, um, a Novell Netware, uh, IBM's uh, Token Ring, it's kind of a slightly different structure, but, and then of course TCP IP and then the up and coming uh, uh, standard of OSI. Uh, we all know how that turned out and, and it's important to realize the, that, that, that by collapsing to TCP IP, it enabled something that we now know and recognize as the World Wide Web. Um, uh, you see in that, in, that, in that sort of flow of technology, you see what, what uh, agreeing on a standard, it doesn't have to be the best standard, it doesn't have to be, you know, the, 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 the standard that one agrees on isn't a, a cap to innovation, but rather it's an agreement to 
all use English or, or all use the, the Roman alphabet or all use, um, you know, to drive on the right side of the road. You know, it, 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 is, it is far, far more important that you have a standard, not that, be, that it be the best standard or, or that it be the, you know, the, the, the you know, many, many other characteristics are far less important than that you, that you agree on the standard because then this is where standards and innovation actually play together very well. Once you agree on the standard, then you innovate on top of the standard. You would not have anywhere near the, the value you in the World Wide Web today if everyone didn't agree on TCP IP, right? And, and so, you know, there's that, that sort of creative tension between uh, singling up on a standard and then the innovation that you, can, that you can have. You have exactly that same choice facing you now in document formats. Uh, uh, thanks to actually, you know, for the first time, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a standard that you can choose. And as a matter of fact, you're, you're, you're bombarded with standards. You know, for a decade or 20 years, you went without any, and now you, uh, you know, including bucks, you've got three that you can, that you can look at. And, and so that's, you know, that's, that's important, and, and I think that's key. Uh, it's what changes the game. Um, my, my other point, and, and this is actually an important point, is um, this is a government-focused uh, uh, conference. Um, I think governments have, have this unique role in, in acquisition and procurement that, that uh, normal commercial companies do not. Governments are spending our tax money, so they're answerable to us. They have, because of that, they have special requirements that their procurement activity is requirements-based and, and one of the best and, and time-honored ways of doing requirements-based acquisitions are through, are through using uh, standards. Uh, open or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, using requirements-based acquisition that you can characterize with standards lets you Doug? gain those obvious, obvious helps, uh, uh, obvious benefits we have of to competition. Move on. Thank you. Next is Arno. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me? So there were different talks already uh, throughout the conference, and especially uh, Andre Di Maio yesterday in his keynote talked about this notion of open standards. I think it's very important to realize that this has become a buzzword. That's the thing you want to have. And because of that, people are abusing it. Uh, there is clearly different uh, differences in how open the standards is. I think there is not a general agreement of what it is. What I think is fair to say is that it's not a black and white thing. It's not either you open or you're not. There is a full spectrum of possibility. When you look at the different uh, uh, document format, comparing ODF and OXML, if you go through the exercise of taking a few criteria that are being proposed and you compare them, you will quickly realize how the fact that OXML does not compare with ODF on these terms, uh, it's, it's been rushed through a standards body that specializes in promoting proprietary formats as a standard through ISO process. And it's, it, with, with an extreme constraint of producing a, a format that would be fully backward compatible with Microsoft Office. ODF in comparison was developed over several years in a totally open and transparent process at Oasis in which Microsoft could have participated but decided not to. So ODF clearly gives you more choice. There is this notion of having two formats might actually lead to more choice. That's a joke. I'm sure you're eager to go buy two DVD players, one that, pro that supports HD DVD and the other one that supports Blu-ray just so you can play every movies, right? I mean, the experience shows that it's much more powerful to have only one format, and things have changed in the IT industry with the web. The web has, show, has proven that separating the way the information is represented and stored from the way you access that information is extremely powerful. And it doesn't prevent innovation. If you look at things like Firefox, Firefox has actually proven that you could do a lot of innovative things, like tab browsing and other things, without even changing the format. So in terms of what you should do now, as government people, you want to actually assess the situation in which you are. You first need to realize that moving to OXML is just moving to another format anyway. It's not like your choice is to stick with the current format or to move to a new format, ODF. The choice you're being given is to choose between two new formats. The cost of migration 
to either one is actually going to be very similar, except that for ODF, you have much more choice because there are many more providers that support full implementation of the standard, some of which are open source and freely available. In fact, when you look at the, the, your situation, you want to actually look at the complexity of the documents. How many times do you actually need to modify all documents? This kind of stuff. And then you need to establish a migration plan. There are different elements you might want to consider. I mean, for one thing, you might want to consider just keeping some old licenses for the current software you have to just be able to access these old documents. You might want to use software that will support both software, uh, both formats. You may want to have prototype projects where you try to find expertise or train people to become like the local gurus that may help people so that they can help answer simple questions. Just changing always is disruptive. But the same will be true whether you go to OXML or ODF. It's an investment you're making. In one case, you're just helping Microsoft to prolong its monopoly over the Office application. In the other case, you're actually freeing yourself from vendor locking, offering yourself the capability of choosing among many software vendors. There, at some point, you need to set some policy internally so that you can actually force things out because the, the tendency for people is actually to stick with the, 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 the status quo. And so you actually need to have this kind of mechanism that will eventually force that. We see it even internally within IBM. I think I'll stop at that for now. OK, thank you. Jim? Thank you. I'm Jim King. I'm my current job at Adobe is PDF architect. Thank you. So I have some very selfish comments. What should we do? I'd like to see the discussion refined a little bit more. If you talk about document formats and office document formats and even open document formats, the predominant document format are PDF files. And yet I have a mixed there's, a, there's a two sides to this, and I want you to look at one side and kind of ignore the other side. I don't want to get into a battle like, maybe battle's the wrong word, but there's a big debate and a dispute about one format and two, and OOXML and ODF. I don't want to get into that. And yet, when you talk about office document formats, I want you to talk about PDF. So how can I get into a two-person brawl without getting in the brawl? And that's my problem, but that's what I want you to do. And the reason I want you to refine the discussion is it's centered around some of these products that process these file formats. And if you look at both the Office file formats for Microsoft Office, and if you look at the ODF file formats, they're editable formats. They're designed to be saved on your disk, read into these applications, worked on, and written back out on the disk. And oh, by the way, if somebody happens to have some compatible software you could send them the file and they could do the same thing. They could open it up and they could change it and they could save it back. So they're editable formats. PDF is output from these same programs. And in fact, the only way you can get it back is to use a utility, Acrobat provides one, so do other people, that goes through a fairly elaborate process to try to regenerate the editable information and make it back into a .doc file, say, to go back the loop. So you can see that loop around diagram says you actually have to go to some work. And usually some information is lost. We, we have ways of preserving it called tagged PDF. But usually information is lost. And so it, it isn't as genuinely editable, and it wasn't intended to be, as the other formats. So they're really in different categories. There's also document forms, which is a very clever idea of freezing some of the information in a file and making some of it accessible and editable and changeable. And it makes it, you make a choice when you design the document which parts you want. So I want you to refine the discussion a little bit. That's my main objective. Now, PDF and our product line that supports it, which mostly is called Acrobat, although today we have a thing called Lifecycle, which is server-oriented. They came out in 1993. At that point, Addison Wesley published the PDF specification as a book. 
and Adobe has ever since that day had a free copy on its website. So, you know, we were, we're, we were planning on coining a term, or we've tried to coin it, of calling open specification. And the reason is, if you look at all the list of properties of open, PDF has been open except for one particular thing, and that was Adobe preserved the right to make the new version of the manual and to write it and edit it. We had a, we had a, uh, a free licensing policy for all our intellectual property from the first day on. We've never sued anybody and never will. We've never threatened anybody with an intellectual property lawsuit, despite what you might have heard. It's always been open. So we've met every criteria for open except for we always preserve the right to write the spec. Well, the second thing I want to say today is in January of last year, we announced we were going to make that open as well. We we're going to submit it to ISO. We have done that on a fast track. There's two tarnished words in this, fast track and, and, uh, and ISO. But, but I actually, I, I think we're doing what those things were intended for and we're doing it the right way. It went out for a ballot on July 2nd for a five-month ballot for a DIS, a draft international standard, and the, it's, it will be due on December 2nd. And uh, we went directly to ISO. We did not try to make it into any other kind of a standard except for the de facto standard that it already was. And uh, oh, the other difference is that we're not using JTC1 we're just going directly to ISO. JTC1 involves, it's a joint technical committee with ISO and IEC. So this won't be an IEC standard where some of the other things are, but we thought being an ISO standard was probably sufficient. Okay, time for the questions now. I have a whole bunch, thank you for submitting them. Very difficult to sort through and pick the right ones, but I tried. So uh, I'll try as far as, as much as possible to go in the same order in, res in, in addressing questions. Um, obviously, I have an imbalance of questions. Uh, about half of the questions are addressed, addressed to Jason. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to have <laughs> to be flexible here in how, how we respond. So uh, I wanted to give equal time for every panelist to not only pre make their presentations, but also respond to questions. So what I suggest we do is when Jason responds to your questions, then we're going to address, we're going to allow at least one other panelist to, to chime in as well on that question. So then, you know, we're going to balance out that way. So let's start with Buck. Question for Buck. Okay. How should community respond when a document standard forces lock in on a single vendor's product? Well, I think part of the answer there is to get involved in the process of the standard setting. Uh, this is the track that your European government is taking right now. Uh, they've come out with a program that they call the Open, open Document Exchange Formats and uh, laid down their own set of vendor requirements. And I would it, you know, thoroughly encourage everyone here to get involved and behind that effort. They've uh, done a very good job of identifying, you know, where the barriers are be between where we are now and the XML future. Thank you. Okay. Question for Jason. If Microsoft believes that value is in the tool first and the format second, why not prove it by supporting both ODF and OOXML? So it's a, it's a good question. It's one that's been uh, around for a long time. And in fact, uh, on the, the point's been made you know, that Microsoft did not participate in the OASIS working group that, that created ODF. Um, the fact is we don't participate in a lot of working groups. Uh, and in fact, many, many projects get spun up that are, are not directly related to our product at the time that they begin. ODF is clearly being used, and one of the things that we um, uh, one of the most important things we had is that as ODF became an ISO standard, even though at the time it was not being broadly used across the industry, and we certainly weren't hearing this from private organizations, many governments were under, um, uh, under legislated mandate that they have to be able to receive and exchange an ISO format if it comes through. Um, there is an open source project that is a translator. This is the, one of the points that I made just before. And there are, in fact, multiple translators already out there, not just from us, but from a wide range. And, and there are 
uh, three or four different companies that are involved in this translator project in terms of being paid to, to make sure that it is industrial grade and, and fully tested and tested against highly complex documents um, and, and many different government forms such as uh, customs exchange forms and whatnot. Um, but you see the need to then say, okay, how is it that I can get to the point that in my file menu I can make my default save as ODF? And so one of the, the choices was uh, to do that through that translator project and put it up that way. Um, over time, if we do hear from a mass number of customers that say, you know what, this is really important to us and it needs to be in the format, uh, I mean in, the, in, the, in your product as a, um, as a, as a, uh, a format, then we'll, we'll definitely consider that and, and work just like we do over time. I think we have over 35 different um, formats today in the Microsoft Office products. We tried to put Adobe's uh, format uh, under its ISO spec. Uh, they asked us not to for various um, uh, reasons within the industry um, at the time, but today you can download and put that format as a save as function from, uh, from our products as well. Over time, this will continue to progress. You know, China has UOF. Are we going to support UOF? Um, Jason, Jason, uh, yes. time. Sorry, there's, there's going to be a long list, and, and the answer is the product will adopt those over time, depending on the need. Okay, Any, anybody else from the panel wants to chime in? Yeah, just, uh, just quickly, uh, as Jason noted, um, uh, uh, you guys want independence of the application and the format. They shouldn't be tied together. This is Computer Science 101. Um, uh, they, of course, have an open source uh, project that they're supporting for uh, uh, using ODF from within uh, Microsoft Office. Um, one of the things that Sun did was, uh, you all, many of you use Open Office, and, and I would hazard a guess that many of you use it to almost exclusively read and write Microsoft uh, uh, binary formats, .doc and .ppt. Um, Sun has taken that expertise of, of being able to handle those formats and incorporated into, or, or actually cleaved off everything else and, and created uh, what we call a plugin for Microsoft Office that allows you to get that same level of fidelity. It is not 100%, but it is, it is quite good and infinitely better than it was four or five years ago um, in, in order to, to, to do that. Keep, keep Microsoft Office and, and go ahead and use ODF. Uh, it's, not, it's not an issue. And we've worked very hard to make it uh, uh, the default and integrated so that it's at a level that, that should, not, should, should not be a big issue. But again, this is something you have to investigate on your own and see if it, meet, it meets your needs. Uh, okay. and, and then, of course, once you have ODF, you can next rev decide which application you actually want. Moving on, next question for Doug. This is for Doug and Arno, so I'm going to allow both of you to respond. If, if all XML becomes an ISO standard, will OpenOffice.org implement it? If multiple applications support both ODF and OOXML, why is that a bad thing? Doug? Um, it, briefly, we're already working on um, uh, incorporating support for OOXML in, in um, uh, uh, OpenOffice.org as well as StarOffice. Frankly, it is completely irrelevant whether it becomes an ISO standard uh, as to whether or not we're going to support it. We, we, are not, um, we are not so foolish. I mean, as a matter of fact, Open Office would be nowhere if it could not support the .doc and .ppt, et cetera, file format. It is, it is absurd to believe that you can work in a world where 95% of the desktops are a particular application which requires a particular format, and then you not interact with that. That is, you know, there's a, there's a principle of minimum astonishment that I apply here. So definitely, regardless of ISO format issues, um, uh, Sun will support OXML with exactly the same pragmatic concerns that, uh, that Jason has over ODF. So I'll, have to, I'll say two things. First of all, even if we wish to implement OOXML, we could not. Because the problem with OOXML is the quality of the specification is so poor, and Microsoft has defined a new law in terms of quality of uh, specification uh, with this specification. Uh, and, and so you might want to try to implement it. I mean, I've talked to people like Microsoft says that novel engineers work with Microsoft engineers in implementing OOXML. And the reason they have to talk to them is simply because you can't implement it just based on the specification. So I don't know if Microsoft is offering the world to uh, call its, its engineers so that they can implement the standard. And in the end, I also think that the prime with having two formats is that it's a distraction. I mean, the web clearly has shown that there is an extremely powerful paradigm in having one format on which you can develop. And like I said, with XML, you, you just free resources from having to worry about that level of, uh, of difficulty. 
and you agree on one solution for a given problem and you move on. You can tackle other things and innovate on top of that instead of trying to keep, you know, dealing with that level of complexity. We're just going in circles. It's not very helpful. Okay, next question, Jim King. The justification for standardization is communication. What can is being done to prevent the community from fragmenting and interfering with communication? One more time. The justification for standardization is communication. What can, what is being done to prevent the community from fragmenting and interfering with communication? Uh, I'm sorry, that escapes me. Uh, the, sending information around is communication. A classic way to send information around today are PDF files. It's been extremely widely adopted. I made a joke with Jason that, or no, it was you, that they were in a session earlier that he had as his reference of what to go read a PDF file. I mean, I think that kind of makes the point. And so I'm, all these files are communication mechanisms, but I think PDF is an excellent one. Um, turning the spec, if that has to do with what I was talking about, turning the spec over to public ownership through ISO just seems to make it better in that everybody in this room can go be on one of the committees and have a say on what changes and additions get put into the next version and Adobe is no longer the sole person in control of that. So I don't see where this, I don't see what exact communication the question's about, but certainly PDF files are a great communication mechanism. They work wonderfully well and, and there's nothing broken that I know of or nothing going to be broken. Okay. Question for Jason. Uh, given Moore's law, changes occurring every 18 months, now, now less, where do you see interoperability issues keeping up with such rapid changes in different platforms and technologies over time? For example, if I implement today, how often will I have to keep upgrading and will it work with uh, other software I'm integrated with? Okay, so I, mean, I think this is a, a broader question than just document formats, and this, this does get to the heart of, of, of why does interoperability matter. I mean, over time, technology continues to progress, and, and I think it is uh, an assumption, certainly on our part, I mean, our business is built around this, that that's a good thing, that you want to see innovation continue, and in fact, you want to see that constant progression of, of uh, challenges, not only in the marketplace where you have uh, competitors, but also within academia and the split off of uh, very um, potentially orthogonal work that may come around over a 10 or 15 year cycle that significantly change the industry. And you certainly see a progression or a, um, a constant challenge to say infrastructure goes at a certain rate and then levels off and then apps follow that and they progress and there's a sort of reverse S growth that you could follow over time. Interoperability is about building bridges in a number of different ways and it's about building bridges for past technologies. It's about thinking about existing heterogeneous environments and being able to uh, have those communications happen. And interoperability, in, in essence, technologically speaking, comes down to looking at the boundaries of products and thinking about things like protocols, data formats, um, uh, application interfaces, and how is it that the products that are built uh, and how do they treat those elements becomes, of course, vastly important to, important to your ability to work with technologies as they progress over time. Um, you know, you'd be hard pressed to say that today, your IT environment is worse off than it was 15 years ago. And that the services you're able to offer constituents, the uh, efficiencies that you were able to bring to government, whatever else it might be because of the progression of technology is a problem. This is a long-term view and, you, and interoperability fits into that view to say I need to have that ability to make those bridges. But you don't want interoperability to become an innovation killer. You want to be able to have that balance where you say hey in a new market it may be that interop is less important as something emerges, but over time, that interop becomes more important in that particular space. And some of this, you could take examples from the consumer arena or from the uh, enterprise computing marketplace. In the 1980s, interop for computing wasn't important. In the early 80s, you had large stacks of mainframes or, or you know, and, and single vendor solutions, hardware, software services. 
And there was no strong internet, there was no strong capability to say I want to have online transactions, I'm going to do all of my procurement with my suppliers and vendors this way like you do today. Over time, enterprise computing changes and then suddenly you start to say I need to interoperability to be a fundamental underpinning of my enterprise experience. You can follow that same track for consumers, for small business, for government, for big business, and I, you can paint this picture out over a long period of time. So I think it's a bigger question than just doc formats. Anybody would like to follow up? You want to go or me? <laughs> it's all right. Uh, I'll try a different mic this time. Um, I, I, I definitely agree with the, uh, with the um, innovation aspect. My, my takeaway here with document formats is this stuff is not rocket science. Uh, document formats could have arguably, very arguably, and, and defend, uh, uh, credibly been standardized a decade ago. Had that been done, um, uh, the innovation that, that could be built on top of those standardized document formats, uh, I think, would have benefited the industry far, far more than what we have right now. Um, and, and the obvious perfect example is, uh, is TCP IP as a networking protocol. Um, uh, there are many other transaction protocols besides just HTTP. There's SMTP, there's NNTP, there's NTP. All of these things are innovations on top of uh, a, a standard of TCP IP. And I, and I think that, that, that what you, what, what you, you don't have to say, yes, I'm better off than I was a decade ago. You have to actually imagine a bit, would I be better off? If I if I had um, uh, standardized and, and been able to innovate uh, and get rid of this sort of gratuitous gratuitous difference, for example, if you had multiple, if the network standards, you know, the, the Microsoft LAN, Novell Netware, if all that stuff had collapsed, you know, a decade earlier, uh, perhaps the the internet, the the World Wide Web, that transaction protocol would have been a, a decade previously. I see I see standards as market um, uh, enablers and market creators, and and unfortunately, you have to you know you have to get rid of you have to standardize and. In order to again build on top of that innovation. Okay, uh, Jason requ requested to, to speak again. Uh, folks, I cannot allow debates because we're going to run out of time, but if you want briefly, A 10 very seconds. Brief I, I just think that different parts of the stack do have different requirements. Document formats are a reflection of the tools that create them, and so the innovation in those tools will change the document formats. A networking protocol is going to be at a fairly different level of the discussion, and I think up and down the stack, you're going to have different requirements and different needs, and I, I just think that it's, it's, it would be inconsistent to say that it's Okay, they, they want to debate, and I have tons of questions. I don't know, real quick, 10 seconds. Just, just one line. I mean, basically, you can hear Jason is still centered around this old model where the tool is the center of attention, when today, clearly, the center of attention is the information. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Question for Doug. Doug, are there federal rules, regulations you would change to increase, facilitate open source, including open documents? Um, I, if, if I were king, yes. Um, but but here, here's the issue, actually. I, I, I worry when one talks about um, open source in the same breath as acquisition and, and uh, uh, requirements-based acquisition and procurement. Uh, and, and that's because open source, as, as many of us have, have, have tried to explain, is, is actually a, a development model as much as it is anything else. I think, I, think what one, I think when somebody else is spending my money, I want them to get best value. Now, if that best value is to buy the most proprietary product in the world because it provides best value, then I want them to do that. I don't, you know, I don't want, I don't want um, a sort of religious-driven uh, uh, acquisition of, of, you know, of, of software that was, you know, made in a particular way in a particular county or, or, or state or anything else. I want best value procurement. Um, historically, in the IT industry, best value value procurement is is seen as being um, enabled by requirements-based and standards and open standards in particular tend to enhance the ability of those of that requirement based acquisition and so you get uh, uh, choice and innovation and competition all those things get enabled as a almost a, a matter of faith by doing standards based acquisition which is which is and and i would actually argue simply that the federal government needs to go back to what they did a decade ago uh, back when they were interested enough in standards that they actually created POSIX in order to allow them to acquire unix systems in a competitive fashion there's a great deal to learn there and why they did it. It wasn't, you know, it, 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 it's, it's an important lesson and I think more people should understand it. Maybe not to, so they don't repeat it. Moving on. Question for Arno. It seems the reason we have several different formats is that history has proven that one size does not fit all. Do you truly believe ODF will resolve this issue? 
Well, this is hard to say. That, that you know, if people don't want to play the game, then you, 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 we are going to lose. That's very clear to me. Microsoft could choose to participate in the ODF TC at Oasis, could bring their requirements, and we could solve the issue altogether. Then it would be possible. Microsoft has chosen not to play that game, and instead, as a last resort, a desperate attempt to stop the adoption of ODF, rushed, created its own standard called OOXML in a clear attempt to try and disrupt the adoption of ODF. Every week or so, there is a new government around the world that, has, that declares ODF is what they are going to use. Okay. I, I would disagree with that. Okay, I expected that. <laughs> <laughs> Register. Okay, I don't have any further questions for Adobe and uh, Open Document Foundation, so if you folks want to respond to Jason's statements next, feel free to, to let me know. Uh, question for Jason. Isn't archival as important a reason for clear, implementable open formats as interoperability? I can still run my X window system code from 1985, but I can't read my undergraduate thesis written that year in Word uh, for Mac 3.0. You should have put it in PDF. <laughs> <laughs> Jason? So, so I, I think archival is a, a significantly important issue, and I think that was why on my slide I put down first principles. And I think that it, for different people in the room, different elements of this conversation are going to be important for reasons that are particular to their environment and what they need. Uh, for, for some people, archival is about proper, you know, storing a document for a certain amount of time and then destroying it. For others, it's about storing that document for not 10 years, but for 200 years or for 1,000 years or whatever it else it might be in the future. Uh, archival comes in, in many different flavors. Um, and, you know, as you look at document formats, there are a number of issues that are going to become very important. Um, if custom schema are built into the specification, the ability to work with custom schema, that will greatly affect the ability for um, uh, archivists to work with the tools that were used to create those documents in the future, potentially those that added additional information above and beyond what was in the core functionality of the given tool, OpenOffice or Word or whatever it was that, that produced it. Um, so this idea that archival is important is a huge discussion and one that is very important. The move to XML-based documents is a huge step in the right direction. It is not the silver bullet. There will still be issues. The one point that I will make out for governments, and this is something I, I, a comment I made in the other room before, is that document formats tend to be the easiest of government archival issues. Um, things like GIS data, things like financial data, how are you going to back up and, and get to your SAP system information in 100 years? or? Or, uh, or more. I mean, these things are, archival is a, is a big discussion and one that is complex. Coming at it from the statement that I'm going to mandate a technology to achieve interop is a mistake. I would completely agree with what Doug just said, that you do want to look at it from the standpoint of what technology is going to get the job done. So for you to say in my procurement, any system I buy has to address archival needs within this context, great. Then it's up to you as the IT department or IT people, decision makers, who are going to then say, okay, what solutions are out there that will meet those first principle needs? Okay, Arnold wanted to follow up? Yes, of course legacy documents are very important, especially for government people. What you need to understand, though, is that OXML does nothing for that purpose. It's not true. <laughs> it's not I'm true. speaking, okay? So, I mean, the prime you have to understand is if Microsoft was really trying to do something good for your documents that exist today, they would actually open the specification of the binary formats in which they are. They could make that clearly specified in such a way that everybody could clearly implement it without any problem. They have chosen to instead create a new format. And the simple fact that it's in XML does not guarantee that it's open. This is a fallacy that people are using. It's a buzzword. It's in XML. Everybody can use it. It's not true. I think it in XML is but the same as uh, um, saying, I'm going to use the Roman alphabet. You can decipher the letters, but it doesn't mean you're going to understand every language written with that alphabet. You won't understand the words, you won't understand the sentence. That's why you need a specification that goes beyond the XML vocabulary, that defines exactly 
how you, the XML format is defined, how you combine different types of data into that format, how it is stored, structured, etc. And the prime with the OXML is the specification, again, is very imprecise in many areas and makes it very hard. So, on, again, from a legacy point of view, it doesn't solve your problem. When you're going to go back to your office, you have all these binary formats, you're going to have to migrate them to OXML, if that's what you choose to do. You have to go through this conversion process. It doesn't do anything for your old documents you might as well translate to ODF. You would be just better off. Okay, Jim wants to follow up, go ahead. Uh, I'm a technical person and I bristle sometimes when the marketing people get us using wrong terminology and screwing things up. So I just thought I'd start a little stirring up. Neither ODF nor OOXML are XML files. They're not. They're zip archives. So it's kind of strange, you know, that we're talking and touting these as XML and everything, when, yes, they have a set of subfiles in there, and there's a fair number of those that are XML files, but there's also, well, I don't know about yours, but our format has binary JPEGs and other things. The reason you go to zip is XML is a really, really bad representation for binary data. People have found tricks to do it by making the data four-thirds bigger and and make it all this unprintable stuff and everything, but it's not good for binary data. So the answer is, don't use it. Put everything in a zip package, put the XML in there, it gets compressed, by the way, by zip, so it makes the file smaller, and then put all your binary stuff in there, you have to fonts, ICC profiles, JPEG files, all that stuff. It works great. But I, we have a format of PDF that is like this, it's called Mars, and you can get it on our website, there's a plugin for Acrobat 8, and you can play around with it, because we've been exploring these ideas for a long time as well. But I insisted that our marketing people not call it an XML document. All the notation, you'll find everything on there that says XML friendly. So I really think these guys ought to change their terminology and, and quit trying to ride this stupid XML horse. Uh, I agree with him completely about the Roman alphabet business, you know. These things are XML friendly and that's really good. I'm not trying to take it away from them, but they're not XML files, folks. They're just not. Okay, now. I have a whole bunch of more questions. There's no way I can address them. So I thought, on this note, if Jason, you would like to say anything else on this subject or anybody else on this panel, so that we conclude maybe with this last question that we, we walk away with at least uh, one question fully addressed. So Jason, do you have anything else to say about the archival part? No, on the archival, it's, we've... We, we, we killed it. Anybody else on this question? Okay. Well, I thank you all, and I thank the panelists, and before we leave, I have a few announcements, so hold on. Okay, first, there, is still a, there are still a few seats available for the creating an open source policy for your organization workshop. So if you'd like to participate, it's going to cost $75, and you stop by the front desk and uh, sign up. And uh, final comments here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Deb Bryant and uh, Oregon State University Open Source Lab for promoting and organizing this successful GASCON. Uh, thanks for all volunteers who helped. And before we, you leave, there will be an online feedback form uh, available by the end of this week. Uh, all presentations will be available for download at the same time. If you fill out the form, you will get access to the download area. So uh, we make a deal. You fill out the form and you get to download. Uh, all of you have a safe trip home, and we hope to see you next year at GASCON 2008. Thank you. Thank you.